tides. It's twilight. <laughs> it's been twilight for hours now. I like it. It's not so bright all the time, cooler temperatures. Uh, it, it's low tide again, and I'm seeing yet another side of life on this planet. Uh, down below, the exposed parts of the scree pile betray signs of furtive life. Though of what, I, I can't really tell. Uh, but up here, I, I've noticed a few things flitting between me and the sky, or, or between me and the ground. Uh, possibly the crepuscular animals, the dawn and dusk shift. <laughs> Back during the twilight hours of the morning, I was in the subs, so I didn't get to see much of it. Those tree things are getting taller again, though not as tall as before. I can see flapping shapes in the distance, indistinct in the dim light. I, I wouldn't mind a flashlight or, barring that, a, a fire. It's likely that a light would draw more of these things, like moths, but I'm not entirely sure. It would require further study about how they orient and navigate, especially since Volturnus acts as a significant secondary light source. Imagine the moon, but, but taking up half the sky. It glows with a, a sickly brownish-orange light, and I, I see pools and shallow streams just stretching out over the horizon, tinged in orange. Uh, the plants here, from shrubs and weeds to lichens, are all colored very similarly to earth plants, and probably take energy from the same wavelengths. But... But, but I wouldn't be surprised to find pigments absorbing that residual heat, that, uh, the IR spectrum, from the subrown dwarf. A, an interesting project for Melissa and Erickson to work with me on would be a wide-reaching study of photosynthesis and position from the tidal zone to the epipelagic. Plants at this level spend most of the day dry and may have more infrared-absorbing pigments to take advantage of Alternus, but as you get further out, high-frequency absorption would dominate for reasons of efficiency. Benthic zones, as I've seen, contain chemoautotrophs feeding off of numerous ocean vents, but there may also be a significant amount of overlap, especially when considering the frequent and cyclical change of the water depth. There could very easily be something like a like a, a Fonzian autotroph distribution spectrum. A fancy name for a hypothetical thing I just made up. But now some of the flying shapes are coming a little closer. Uh, be back in a moment. They're, they're very much shaped like birds, which isn't all that surprising to me. Unlike the water, the air is a pretty unforgiving medium. Only a few very specific shapes will allow something heavier than air to leave the ground. Uh, that said, the lower gravity, a little bit more than half of Earth's, allows them to be pretty big. These have maybe a 10 to 12 foot wingspan, frankly, not that far off from the largest species of terrestrial birds. My best description for now is a, a, a black or darkish thing shaped a little like a pterodactyl, uh, similar to the older kinds of paleo art, but without the sagittal crest. Uh, their posture reminds me of vultures as well, and I'll call them birds for now. They have two distinct back legs, a, a third possibly vestigial tail or limb on the back, in addition to two forelimbs modified to bat-like wings. Their torsos... I don't know, there's something just wrong with them. God, I wonder what their skeletal structure looks like. Uh, they're different somehow from other Fonzie in life. Uh, perhaps it's just the two-dimensionalness of them. Everything else alive here is rounded, but they are sharp black shadows with severe membranous wings. A little scaly looking, actually and long, straight-edged, vicious beaks. Those wings must have actual bone or, or some solid internal skeleton in them too, which is a, a departure from the soft, water-filled invertebrates I've encountered so far, and oh, oh shit. Okay, uh, 
one of them has landed here just now uh, on top of the largest boulder near my position. <laughs> uh, swooped in and scared the hell out of me. I'm not sure if it even saw me. I, I've wedged myself into a crevice between the two rocks, but I, I can hear it scrambling around up there. That beak, which is poking out over the edge every few minutes, must be at least two feet long. Probably a, a third of the total body length, I'd estimate. It ends in a point like like a chisel. The, the face, or from what I've seen, is black or maybe dark brown, with, with four eyes, two above the beak and two below which <laughs> is, a, is a nod to the rest of the planet's renal symmetry. And it is attached to quite a powerful neck. <laughs> I, I think I can guess what they've evolved to eat. All right, uh, another one is joining it. And now another. They're, they, they're scrabbling around all over above me. It's uh, frightening. But at the same time, it's refreshing, almost, to have some sort of land life around. It makes it feel less lonely. But there's more of an intrinsic feeling of threat. Birds of prey have meaning in the archaic brainstem I inherited from my small furry ancestors. Their claws, their silent shadows, their soulless eyes, it's, it's disquieting. Uh, now, now they're leaving, one after another, uh, synchronized, ungainly leaps smoothing out into perfect looping dives down towards an outlying shell. Hopefully I'll see some feeding behavior. <laughs> it's a good thing you aren't here, Stevens. Maybe cover your ears for the description. Those beaks are awfully sharp and the creatures inside their armor look pretty soft. Once you get through the shells... Oh... Wow. So they certainly got a few good cracks in. Now that I think of it, the shell that they attacked may have already had a few gouges. Like, this wasn't the first time it's been targeted. Take a whack and run away again. That, that seems to be their strategy. Run away, because as soon as the first one landed, a yellow mist started leaking out of the shell. And, and by the time the third one could bring its beak down, the mist was fairly thick and noxious looking. The flying animals started to seem uneasy, moving their heads around and, and shifting their footing. A and then all at once, the other 14 shells on this side began to vent gas as well, and, and the three birds just took off, circled, and, and then left. Uh, the, the yellowish gas hangs low and it's slowly dissipating. <laughs> I'm staying the hell away from it for now, because I suspect it to be chlorine and <laughs> my suit filters can keep it out probably but i i don't want to go wading through a hydrochloric acid filled stream if i don't have to now i i'm pretty sure the creatures in the shell have no way of seeing and and based on their behavior might be entirely blind even when outside of them I, I noticed the attack shell didn't begin to release gas until the first bird thing landed, which which supports my theory at least superficially. It, it does imply another method of sensing. But the really intriguing thing was the response from the rest of the shells. There was there was coordination there. For, for Montague's and Melissa's benefit, I will mention that the appearance of coordination and communication is extremely common among all levels and scales of organisms on Earth. Uh, 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 for instance, plants and trees of many species increase their production of defensive toxins when attacked by herbivores. Uh, then downwind of those plants, others not being attacked will respond to the presence of a chemical signal passed on the breeze and increase production of those same toxins. Uh, sometimes they even use a network of underground fungi to pass these signals along as well. This gave birth to a lot of misleading ideas of the neural network of the forest and trees talking to each other, which are not exactly untrue, but put too much agency or intention into these functions. And yes, Stevens, I read your dissertation, and let's just say you're lucky I wasn't there for your defense. 
simplest explanation, Occam's razor, uh, since they have orifices in the shells from which to vent gas, it, it's reasonable to assume that, like the trees, it's an automatic reaction to sensing the gas through the same orifices. Uh, much like the plants, there's no thought to it. It's simply an evolved, almost mechanistic response that benefits the survival of the group, even if one individual has gradually worn down and eventually lost.